Uh, if this was uh, an upbeat title and you came expecting to be uplifted, then I think you're going to be disappointed. This is a very disappointing lecture. The starting point here, I think, is if you want to think about recovery, I think traditionally we think that policy could help it in three sorts of ways. That, that said, of course, recoveries are often just spontaneous, but they could, uh, can be helped. Fiscal stimulus, well, we all learn about that in basic macro. Monetary stimulus, likewise. The third thing I think we need to consider, though, is supply-side reform. And supply-side reform might be quite important if you think that the first two are rather out of reach or relatively uh, weak in their possibilities. Uh, thinking of where we are at the moment, I'm going to take, for the purposes of the lecture at least, that fiscal stimulus is ruled out by sticking to Plan A and fiscal consolidation, though I am going to say that you might be able to do fiscal consolidation in a somewhat different way and that that might be slightly more growth friendly. I'm going to also say that I think the scope for monetary stimulus is probably relatively limited if we take ourselves to have interest rates at the zero lower bound, we can't cut nominal interest rates much more, then we might be able to find some other ways of introducing monetary stimulus, but they're probably going to be unconventional. We certainly might, for example, want to think about real interest rates rather than nominal interest rates, uh, and that could potentially give us some sort of handle. If we think about supply-side reform, then the sort of thing that we might find uh, working through there is policies which make it more attractive for the private sector to invest. We might find that uh, if we change the policy or institutional environment, we could get more total factor productivity growth. We mustn't, I think, uh, limit ourselves to thinking that you can only change the productivity growth rate through investment in physical or human capital by the government, although that might certainly be quite important. We can think with modern growth theory, the micro foundations matter, and that brings into play things like the state of competition, how regulation is organized, the structure of taxation, and so on. And I think we know from a lot of empirical work, and I do like numbers and I do like the empirics, I think we do know that those things can matter and they can change the growth rate at least a bit in the medium term. Or more accurately, perhaps governments don't do so well and they hurt the growth rate in the medium term. The problem, though, I think, is we need something uh, present which has short-term effects as, long as, as well as long-term effects. And ideally, we like something which is good for the short-term and is also acceptable in the long-term. We don't particularly want to get one thing in the way of the other. Okay, fiscal consolidation, just so we're all on the same page, perfectly straightforward, I think. We're thinking here of some sort of uh, reduction in government spending and or increases in taxes, improving fiscal sustainability. We're worried that we're borrowing too much. We need to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio in the long run, possibly at a lower number than uh, it is now. Uh, when we find ourselves needing fiscal consolidation, well, banking crises are a traditional uh, reason for that. That's very much the theme of the Reinhardt and Rogoff book, which many of you will have read, I think. Uh, wars, well, for Britain, World War I and World War II created massive problems of this kind. And, of course, we don't have profligate governments, so that's irrelevant. Uh, only banana republics would worry about that. Although I did once hear an Irish person say she was unwilling to come to Britain because it was a banana monarchy. Now, that was a few years ago. I think she may have been right at the time. Okay. The problem with fiscal consolidation, of course, is conventionally we think of macro effects here on demand. We probably imagine that demand is going to be reduced by this rather than increased, unless we've got some sort of policy to offset the adverse effect, or that the public se uh, private sector is so worried about what the public sector is doing uh, that it's relieved by the announcement of um, uh, more fiscal stringency. Generally speaking, I think we probably need some sort of offset policy if we're not going to find in the short run at least some negative effect on aggregate demand. Uh, for the purposes of this evening, I'm going to take fiscal consolidation as a given that that's what our government is doing. It's, in a sense, the basis of the coalition agreement. Uh, 
And uh, there is a point to be made that delaying fiscal consolidation for a long time at least will eventually jeopardize things and risks an excessive debt to income ratio. When debt to income ratios go over 100%, we might start to worry. We're not there yet, but we're heading in that direction if we don't do something. And of course, at some point, the debt dynamics might get unstable. One way in which one can deal with this problem, but I'm going to assume for today that this is off limits, would be financial repression. That's essentially what we did after World War II. We reduced the debt to GDP ratio in particular by engineering a situation where the real growth rate was very considerably above the real interest rate. And that changes the fiscal arithmetic considerably. I think it's predicated on a world of capital controls and I suspect we're not going back to that and that's why I'm thinking perhaps that's not feasible or desirable. But the composition of fiscal consolidation we'll certainly want to come back to. Uh, just again to flag up, I think fiscal consolidation clearly does have productivity implications. We can think of those fairly obviously in terms of are some structures of taxation more favorable to growth than others. Broadly speaking, I think the modern empirical literature suggests you'd probably prefer on the whole uh, to raise indirect taxes rather than direct taxes. Uh, probably that's uh, the general sort of mood of that. And maybe you would prefer, if it's only growth you're interested in, to cut transfer payments rather than perhaps infrastructure spending or something of that sort. Those are sorts of choices that you have to make and they potentially certainly will have growth implications. But notice that fiscal consolidation more generally can work through quite a lot of other things. If we think about the way it was done in the 1980s, benefits were changed quite a lot. Over time that changed the benefit to wage rate ratio and arguably had an effect on the NIRU on the uh, level of unemployment which was consistent with stable inflation. Uh, we, with pension systems, we can change the retirement rules if we want, and that will change the size of the labor force, potentially. Uh, we'll certainly again have implications for real GDP per person uh, in the economy. In the 80s, part of what we did was privatization. Uh, there might be supply side reasons for that, but it also clearly could be part of a fiscal consolidation. Uh, I believe that's being advocated to Greece at the moment with um, not a great enthusiastic take up. Uh, in principle, I think it's reasonably easy to design fiscal consolidations that would be supply side friendly, but that tends to run into questions of can the politics stand it and is it fair? So fairness is clearly uh, a limitation on what you can do. So what I'm going to, to start with is looking at two past periods of recession and recovery, and then I'll, I'll put uh, against those experiences where we are now, and uh, in particular then go on into supply side reform. So the periods I've chosen I think have the common feature of fiscal consolidation. That's happening at least in the early 30s in Britain. It's happening in the Thatcher years in the 80s uh, again in Britain. And clearly, as I said already, it's happening now. Uh, it is fair to say that neither of those other periods had a banking crisis. And I think that uh, might be quite important. It might mean that we have a bigger uphill struggle than they did. As you'll see in a moment, there were similar downturns initially, but as we'll see as we go on through the next few slides, quite different policy responses. In both the previous periods, there was a strong recovery, which was starting to take place about four years after the recession began. Uh, I would suggest in parenthesis here that you do not read the exceptionally silly chapter in the current is issue of the World Economic Outlook. Uh, if only the IMF put a little money into economic history consultancy, uh, they wouldn't write such silly things. And please leave that in the film. Uh, <laughs> they promised they'll edit out the most infelicitous remarks, uh, which I'm liable to make, and you'll have more fun if I do. So what can we learn from comparing these? Uh, here, first of all, is the obvious simple chart. You'll have seen that, probably many of you, in some guise or other. The National Institute has one similar to that. I I've uh, slimmed it down to the three cases I'm comparing, and it is done on a quarterly basis, and it's quarters from the start of each of the periods. Um, let me say, uh, I'm not absolutely sure the green line is right, 
Uh, I checked it as recently as two days ago, but it quite well, quite well could have changed since then. It seems to change almost every time I go to the ONS website and spend half an hour finding the most simple thing that I want. Uh, I think it is fair to say that we know quite a lot more about GDP in 1935 than in 2011, but Joe Grice promises me it will get better eventually, and I suppose we can believe it. Nevertheless, I think the general story is correct in this chart, namely that by this far into the recession in those earlier periods, you'd embarked on recovery. And I think the, the slide there is, is not, it's not drawn to a misleading scale. Once it started, in each case, the recovery really was quite strong. Okay, let's turn to the 1930s, which uh, even I'm not quite old enough to remember. In the first phase of recovery in the 30s, we are very definitely seeing it happen during fiscal consolidation. The balanced budget was the general idea of the time, and at least nominally they stuck to it as much as they could. When the world downturn came at the start of the 30s, this prompted uh, a move to override the automatic stabilizers, to cut back. That was the issue on which the minority Labour government resigned in 1931, and the ensuing coalition imposed some Cuts. And broadly speaking, to an approximation, I think we can say the structural deficit was probably reduced by of the order of 4% of GDP. And the budget was actually balanced by 1933, which is in a sense quite an astonishing thought to modernise. <laughs> Strong growth, as you saw on the chart, starts in 1933. We're seeing 4% a year growth or something like that. We are not seeing any fiscal stimulus at that stage. We are, however, seeing monetary stimulus. Monetary stimulus, first of all, comes in the conventional way of reducing nominal interest rates to the lower bound, basically. But once they get there, the cheap money policy of the time, I think, is a credible commitment to have moderate inflation over the next few years. It was phrased in terms of returning to the price level of 1929, ideally by 1935, which was not actually uh, achieved. And I think what's happening there is a commitment to inflation, if it's believed by the private sector, is essentially a way of reducing real interest rates, even when money interest rates can't be cut. The key to being able to do this was leaving the gold standard, obviously enough, that allows you control of your monetary policy and a chance to change inflationary expectations. And I think that's basically what's happening uh, at the time. Again, uh, there's possibly a lesson there for the Eurozone, but that's not for today. Here are some numbers very quickly on the public finances, and you do see in the 30s this overhang of debt from World War I, which worries them so much and constrains policy. You can see the changes in the budget deficit and the structural deficit, and if you look carefully down to the bottom, you can actually see that fiscal policy relaxes in the later 30s. Fiscal policy looks classically pro-cyclical, in fact, in that story. The cheap money policy, I think, was a coherent framework. It was arrived at by 1932. The key point here was it was the Treasury that was in charge of monetary policy, not the Bank of England. That, I think, is what basically made the commitment to inflation and financial repression, they went together, uh, credible. It was in the Treasury's interests. It was the antidote to opening Pandora's box and conceding to the Keynesians, and it dealt with the fiscal arithmetic which was so worrying to them. It's entirely understandable then that the private sector would see the Treasury as uh, wanting this policy, given its worries about debt uh, management. Uh, there we see real interest rates and indeed nominal interest rates. Uh, one simple measure, just the short-term real interest rate, but perhaps the easiest one to measure. Uh, those are the, the Dimsdale and Chadhar estimates from a few years ago. If you want to have a, a cheap money policy and a monetary stimulus, I think you do want to ask, well, how would it affect the real economy? If you want to think about how it affected the real economy in the 1930s, I think in the forefront of your picture is surely going to be house building. They built a lot of houses in the 1930s. 
293,000 is just the private sector number in the peak year. Those of you who have a sense of today's numbers, that's of the order of three times what we're building at the moment. It was an interesting world. It became easier to get a mortgage, not harder. Uh, building societies had lots of money. They were reaching out to new groups of punters and so on. And it was a world in which there were no planning restrictions. That's not strictly true, but there were virtually no planning restrictions. I think the option value of delay to developers after 1932 wasn't very big. So there's a chart just to show you that I do like numbers. My anorak tendency is coming out here. Uh, those are on six-month basis. You have to do a bit of arithmetic to add up to 293K, but you've got there already. You've done it. We can pass on. In the second phase in the 30s, there is a fiscal stimulus, I think. The fiscal stimulus comes from rearmament. We can always argue about how exogenous fiscal policy changes are, but I think this probably is a reasonable candidate for an exogenous fiscal shock. It was introduced into the economy while short-term interest rates were still essentially held constant. I've been doing some work on this recently. I think it does raise real GDP. And it probably raises GDP, according to my estimates with Terry Mills, by of the order of 7% by 1938. That said, I do not think that's based on a high fiscal multiplier. I think it is based on announcements of massive future defence spending. I think that's a really important distinction to make. I actually think the multiplier in the 1930s was probably much lower than the conventional Keynesian literature proposes. One reason why that might have been the case is that very high debt to GDP ratio. The modern literature suggests when public debt to GDP is high, the multiplier, other things equal, tends to be low. Perhaps Ricardian equivalence matters more in those circumstances. Just a, a sort of postscript on the 1930s. I do want in each episode to think about supply side policy. I want to suggest that supply side policy in the 1930s was a disaster in Britain. It was a disaster actually partly because it pursued so assiduously the aim of raising the price level. There are different ways of raising the price level. If you choose to raise the price level by increasing market power, which is essentially what happened in the 1930s, you can get all sorts of nasty side effects. And you may also find that it takes a very long time to get rid of those policies. And that's basically what happened to Britain. Uh, the capital controls, the cartels, devaluation, the tariffs, they're all basically price raising, if you like. They're perfectly understandable as this short-term fix if the price level is what you're about, but they introduce weak competition. And I think they basically take several decades to reverse. Tariffs in the mid-1960s were as high in Britain as in the mid-1930s. You know, and that, I think, tells you something of the story. Okay, punctuated, I've got three of these lesson slides. If you're nearly asleep, I say lessons. Pavlovian response, you perk up and say, ah, what did I learn while I was asleep? Okay, well, what we've learned here, I think, uh, my three things here are, firstly, that conventional inflation targeting starts to become quite questionable in an episode of fiscal consolidation if you're at the lower bound. Uh, particularly perhaps after a banking crisis when you need to cut real interest rates. Second thing I think we learned, and this was the stuff about the house building, is that if you can deliver monetary stimulus, you're quite interested in facilitating the transmission mechanism from that to what we might call real investment. And thirdly, and this I think goes against some conventional discussion at the minute, I'm not convinced myself that we can automatically assume the fiscal multiplier is high when you're at the lower bound. There are certainly models which will give you that result. It's, it's credible intellectually, but I think it's a question practically. Uh, the multiplier, it seems to me, is quite a contingent concept. Onwards and upwards, I hear you saying. Not a single joke has passed my lips, I'm pleased to say. In these politically correct times, I don't do jokes. Used to be quite an amusing lecturer, but no more. <laughs>
What's the relevance of the 1980s for this story, apart from the fact that it is a time, or was a time, of fiscal consolidation? I think here we're talking about a government which was, if you like, keen to reduce the rate of inflation in the economy. It's a disinflationary period. And I think their strategy, I think this is reasonably well known, involved the opposite of fiscal stimulus. We're clearly reducing government spending. We're trying to cut the budget deficit. But it also involved, uh, partly through the ending of capital controls, it also involved a sharp upward movement in the real interest rate. And people spent quite a lot of time talking about what happened to real interest rates. I think there's no question that real interest rates went up in the 80s. You can argue a bit about exactly how much. So I don't think this is monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus. I seem to recall 364 of my colleagues in 1980-81 uh, thinking that this was uh, the end of the world, more or less, and regretting the fact that neither of these uh, stimuli to recovery was, was allowable. Okay, looking back on it now, I think we perhaps say, well, there were quite a lot of changes to supply-side policy. I think there's not much doubt that they had some positive effects on productivity and output per person in the longer run. I'm going to argue towards the end of this little section, I think actually almost by accident, they also hit on policies which had quite a stimulating effect in the short run. So here, I think, is an example where the short and long run perhaps come together. I think the real success in the supply side policies was they did improve total factor productivity performance somewhat. Uh, they did, over the medium term, reduce the narrow uh, compared with uh, uh, earlier times. That's sort of Steve Nichols' story, not so much mine. And I think they did put the economy in a position, particularly through low regulation and having sorted out industrial relations problems, or largely done and so uh, to facilitate the rapid diffusion of ICT. The short-run stimulus, I think, comes through the effect of deregulation on bank lending and on consumer spending. It's that relaxation of regulation which has the short-term effect. You can certainly argue that went too far, but broadly speaking, you could certainly also say we had a very repressed capital market previously, and this was, broadly speaking, in the right direction, if not entirely carried out appropriately. Uh, there's the real interest rate story for the 1980s, and you can see it's a very different trajectory from the 1930s. Here are the public finances in the 1980s. Uh, by now, you no longer have much of the debt overhang from World War II left, uh, but you do have changes in the budget deficit and the structural deficit. Uh, that clearly is quite a big change. It's of the order of 5% plus of GDP in the structural uh, deficit. Thinking of supply-side policy, which I've spent probably more of my time writing about than I should for the 1980s, I think the hallmark is from industrial to competition policy. I think that is the most important of these things, even if not the most famous. I think that makes a lot of difference over the medium term, and I think that's a lesson we really forget at our peril in trying to innovate supply-side policy today. But clearly, there were aspects of fiscal consolidation which changed the supply side. Uh, I mentioned a couple in the preview, privatization, um, restructuring of taxation took place. This was a move to cut direct income tax rates, high rates in particular, and to uh, increase the take from value-added tax. Uh, benefit to wage rate ratios were reduced. I mentioned that. Uh, more famously, perhaps, trade union power was undermined. I think the process from industrial to competition policy isn't simply the 80s. It isn't simply Thatcher. It starts with trade liberalization in the 70s. It continues to explicit reform of antitrust policy uh, under the, the Blair government uh, in the late uh, 20th, early 21st century. Uh, but nevertheless, it clearly was a major thrust of Thatcher's Britain. And it came against the background of a very unfortunate experience in the 1970s. Uh, an experience where industrial policy had been the order of the day. Partly general policies which were badly targeted, investment subsidies, but a lot of this was actually selective industrial policy. 
And the really important things to note about that very quickly are that the huge bias of the subsidies was towards subsidizing ailing industries. Shipbuilding got a fantastic amount of money in that period. Politicians do not like exit. That's a very important thing to bear in mind. I've never ever heard a politician say these job losses are good news. It's a shame they ought to sometimes. But the high-tech policies of the day didn't succeed either. The national champions were unsuccessful. Um, so that doesn't say you never should have selective industrial policy. I think it does say you shouldn't repeat what we did then. Competition and productivity growth, I think it's become fairly uh, widely accepted now. It's one of the biggest changes in applied economics, I think, in the last 20 years in the productivity area. That on the whole, competition tends to be, or more competition tends to be positive for productivity performance, at least starting from where Britain had been in the 60s. It's not quite the same thing as saying you want totally perfect uh, competition. But I do want also to mention, because it's often forgotten, that I think competition was the key antidote to the industrial relations problems that we knew and loved or knew and hated in the 1970s. And we see a lot of evidence of organizational change having effects on productivity. Uh, we essentially, I think, see uh, competition as making some of the uh, rent-seeking behavior of the 1970s no longer feasible. It wasn't a miracle cure. Productivity performance does improve, uh, but it doesn't improve dramatically uh, off the board. Y upon HW is labor productivity measured per hour. Total factor productivity is the usual neoclassical sort of definition. The relativities compared with France and Germany do eventually improve, uh, but they don't improve as dramatically as the, the people who think it was a miracle cure in the 80s would imagine. And one of the reasons I'm going to suggest for that is that there are some big weaknesses remaining in supply-side policy after that period. We do know, according to research by people like Steve Nichol, that the Nehru came down following the reforms from the 1980s through the early 90s. Uh, I note the point in bullet two there that it probably was the Conservatives who made the key decisions uh, this did include tax and benefit reforms. Quite interesting point and very important when you look at the empirical literature is that does mean that more people are in the labor market in a country like Britain than in France, um, say, and the people who are excluded in France are probably disproportionately low productivity workers. So this policy to reduce the Nairu, I think in effect leaves lower productivity employment as something which is viable in Britain to a greater extent than in France. If I'm right about that, then there are people in the empirical literature trying to put numbers on it. Bull and Set are the people who produced this six percentage points effect for France. The paper was written under the auspices of the Banque de France. Sorry if I've pronounced their names rather badly. So when we look at real GDP per person, we get a somewhat different uh, story. Uh, by 2007, we actually noticed that on the numbers for that year, the move in relative economic decline was such that real GDP per person was a little bit higher in the UK than Germany or France. We can argue now and say, well, maybe there was an element of falseness about that. The, the output gap would need to be adjusted for, and perhaps we were, in some sense, in an overheating uh, economy. Nevertheless, broadly speaking, I think you'd have been surprised by that outcome if you'd looked at things at the end of the 70s. This was somewhat good news. In the ICT age, then the UK does, uh, I think, relatively well. It invests relatively quickly and a large amount in ICT capital, and that probably is supported by light regulation. Uh, if you look at the OECD's work on this, they did a lot of work on it. The further across the horizontal axis you are, the more regulated your product markets are, the less friendly to competition they are. The vertical axis, the more contribution to productivity you get from ICT intensive services, GBR, 
seems to be incorrect there, it should be UK, but uh, I've just reproduced their chart, uh, is at the left-hand side of the chart. And again, if you did a growth accounting story, you'd see quite a strong ICT contribution, and I think that's quite an important, if partly accidental, result of what happened in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I do think, and this relates to Wendy's remarks at the beginning, there's still actually quite a lot of scope for further diffusion of ICT. This is not complete. Okay, let's just finish the 1980s story off by thinking about the uh, short-term impact uh, on the story. And here I think I turn, and I've certainly helped in producing these numbers, I turn to John Mulbauer and his work, and he's helped me quite a lot here, uh, Mulbauer tried to measure the liberalisation of financial markets and to take very seriously what that implied for, let's call it the consumption function, if you wish. John's results, I think, show rather clearly that the relaxation of the constraints involved in the liberalisation, directly and indirectly, i.e. through direct effects you could borrow more and indirect effects working through things like house prices, uh, tended to raise personal sector borrowing, lowered the household savings rate, and so on. The Mulbauer numbers give you quite a big uh, bang for the buck here. By 1987, you're talking about something like 3.5% of GDP, extra demand, if you like, and over six or seven years, that's averaging more than half a percent a year. So this is non-negligible. There's the household savings ratio. Uh, notice the very different behavior in the 80s compared with now. And there's the credit conditions index which uh, Mulbauer uh, devised. And you can see uh, the sharp jump up from the latter part of 1980. Going up means liberalization, as you would expect. Okay, lessons. So I see people sit up with a jerk at the back. Yeah, lessons too. The 1980s I do take to be an episode of fiscal consolidation that potentially improved the supply side. I think we started at the beginning of the period with a lot of bad policies to dump. By no means did we deal with all of them. Public sector reform was notably absent, actually, in the uh, 1980s. Uh, something else that was absent I'll mention in a moment. I do think strengthening competition was central. I mentioned the 364 a little while ago. I was quite affronted at the time because nobody asked me to sign. <laughs> I probably would have if asked, but uh, I was a nobody. Okay. I think what we'd say with hindsight is probably they underestimated the value of the supply side uh, reforms. And the deregulation of the period, I think it did succeed in crowding in private sector spending which is really quite a nice thing to do in the context of fiscal consolidation. Where are we today? Well, macroeconomic policy and post-2009, assuming that those numbers I showed you at the start are not completely bogus, recovery has been faltering quite badly in the last couple of years. I think we can certainly say, as the newspapers tend to, there are strong headwinds. The euro situation isn't helpful. The banking crisis and its aftermath, bank lending behavior, isn't helpful. So there's more for policy to struggle against, if you like. I think we can probably also say we're not going in for fiscal stimulus. And we've got nominal interest rates pretty much at the lower bound. Not only do we have nominal interest rates at the lower bound, you might say policymakers don't quite have the free hand that, in a sense, exit from the gold standard gave them. Exit from the gold standard meant the rule book had been completely torn up. You were starting ab initio, if you like. Here, you've got a situation where we've had massive political capital invested in our inflation targeting regime, where we'd probably like to return to it as soon as normal times occur. That very fact makes it quite hard, I think, credibly to promise quite a lot of inflation here and to act on the real interest rate. If that's the case, then I think we surely turn to the question, are there some growth-friendly things we could do on the supply side? Are there things we could do to improve the nature of fiscal consolidation and more medium-term reform? 
Uh, there we have, uh, sorry, I perhaps should have clicked on this and back again. Uh, there we have the difference in bank behavior now and then. Notice the bank advances in the 80s soaring ahead. Nothing like that now. Fiscal consolidation since 2010 then. Has it been a growth-friendly mixture? Well, I don't really think it has, to be honest. Um, and maybe that just implies the political constraints are too strong or fairness uh, matters. The good news, if you think of things which the empirical literature says would be growth-friendly in the medium term, are the reduction in the corporate tax rate, uh, which is steadily happening through 2015, and, uh, if you like, a, a move on the other side towards raising uh, value-added tax, or the rate thereof. At the same time, when we look at the numbers, the thing which is going down, surely, is net investment, not current expenditure. And our growth-friendly package is probably not going to have that characteristic. The most obvious thing to do to increase the take from indirect taxation, I would imagine, would be to widen the value-added tax base. That hasn't happened. And if we look at, not at the hoo-ha about 50% and 45%, but if we just look at the people who are creeping up into the standard higher rate band, a lot of people are creeping over that threshold. And that has gone largely unremarked. I don't think those things are very growth friendly. These are all in current prices. They're from the OBR. I see Paul sitting in the middle there, and I'm sure these numbers could be improved upon, and I'm sort of freezing here. He's going to get up and throw something at the screen, I dare say. But nevertheless, if, if you can bear with this and say the detail may not be quite right, but the gist of it perhaps is, then looking at that, the current spending going up, the net investment going down, uh, I think that's symptomatic of a, a package which is not entirely thinking about growth. Now, let's turn then to supply-side reform more generally, or the supply-side picture in the economy. Let me say, I think, since the 1980s, we have, in my view, rightly said that the most important things to do on the supply side are to have good horizontal industrial policies, if we can use that OECD speak. So this is, if you like, setting the framework conditions. It's dealing with market failures. It's providing an environment which uh, delivers on high-quality human capital infrastructure, which sets regulation and competition uh, policies in a way which is basically pro-productivity, uh, if you like, rather than developing industrial policies which overtly and deliberately try to pick on particular sectors and subsidize them. And, and that would be the difference in emphasis after the 1970s. I think we can immediately see some success stories. Pharmaceuticals is one most of us would be aware of. I suspect that has a lot to do with Britain's investments in science and human capital. We can argue about it later, perhaps. Financial services. I think human capital is important there. The regulatory stance, 1986, was quite important. And that's been a success story that perhaps went too far. We perhaps had too much of a good thing. Regulation wasn't, in the end, quite well enough designed. Uh, we also know that for financial services to work in the British case, they need a successful agglomeration. Agglomeration is absolutely central there, and we have had some supportive policies. ICT diffusion, and I want to come back to that word diffusion in a minute or two. Uh, there, again, our investments in human capital have been helpful, uh, and our regulatory stance, I think, has basically been helpful. Nevertheless, I think, and the evidence on productivity tends to bear it out, on horizontal industrial policies, we could do better, should try harder. And I'm going to suggest four areas in which I think improvements are necessary and improvements would be signalled by this empirical growth literature which Wendy was referring to. So these are all things where I think I can back up the story from the applied growth economics literature. And remember that when we're thinking about effects on growth, we are thinking about these microstructures, the incentive structures to invest, to innovate, and rapidly and expeditiously to adopt new technologies. Very important, that last one. Infrastructure, 
Well, on the report card there, I think we clearly see not good enough. What's wrong here? Well, we've been spending far too little over many years in investing in public capital. If you look at the standard papers that are out there on public capital and economic growth, particularly the work of Christoph Camps, but quite a lot of other people at OECD. Camps provides a formula which you can interpret to find the growth maximizing level of public capital in the economy. There are some sensitive parameters that you need to think you know the value of, but I think any reasonable choice of those parameters is going to leave you saying there was too little investment for many years before the crisis. Uh, my own estimate based on camps in a paper a few years ago was about 1% or a bit more than 1% of GDP more per year might have been invested. I spent a lot of time, sadly, working on the Eddington report. I say sadly, it was a great report completely ignored. Uh, the Eddington report pointed out that uh, we have done a terrible job in selecting transport projects. We've had a massive bias in favour of rail and against road, and we have rationed capital in such a way that lots of road projects with very high benefit to cost ratios are not done. The bias continues, he said, reminding you that he comes from South Warwickshire. Yeah. Geographic clue there, South Warwickshire. Yes. Okay. Big welfare gains from better, not only investment in the transport system, but management of it. I think most economists do believe that road pricing in some guise or other would be a very sensible complement to this story. And perhaps we need a serious change in governance structure as far as roads provision is concerned. Perhaps they should be a privatised utility. Who knows? Dieter Helm, I think he's pushing it. Education. This seems a bit like my report card at school. I always got could do better. I usually, we, we had scores for effort and achievement. I usually got sort of B to plus for achievement, but C minus for effort. I think this is pretty similar here, actually. What do we know about education? Well, we know there are some quite good papers out there which take seriously the econometric problems of relating educational performance to growth. And possibly the best recent paper is the Hanasek and Woosman one in economic policy a year or two ago. They emphasise the important thing is quality of education, not simply quantity. OK, there's arguments about how you might measure it. The best proxy we've got that's capable of being used widely econometrically, basically a test score results, and they're what Hanasek and Woosman would call cognitive skills. Their research and other people's, though, goes on to say why or when do you get high cognitive skills scores? Not by spending massive amounts of money, but by dealing with the principal agent problems in the schooling system. Two things are necessary there. One is a serious amount of competitive entry into schooling. And the second is serious externally provided exams. I think we do see here the government uh, thinking about these issues to give it its due. Uh, looking at the cognitive skills story in the Hanasek and Woosman uh, data set, uh, we do find the UK not scoring very well compared with the people at the top of the league. Those are just the top six in the, uh, in the story, which is based essentially on the PISA uh, approach. This seems to be a phrase I've heard before. Tax doesn't have to be so taxing. That was that dreadful advertisement that the last government used to produce every time it came up to self-assessment day. All right, well, I think tax doesn't have to be so taxing, and I hope Paul won't be too offended by this slide as well. Um, the Murley's Review, it seems to me, provides a very powerful case for arguing that our tax system is not well designed, whatever its objectives are. And picking and choosing from that report, because I'm interested in the growth aspect here, I suggest there would be a pretty powerful case for reform. What sorts of things would you do? Well, perhaps you might, but this is just for illustration. You might indeed try expanding the take from VAT,
on a revenue neutral basis, offsetting it against changes in capital taxation, perhaps exempting the normal rate of return uh, on investment. And that would, I think, match the sort of general OECD story uh, about what kinds of tax systems give you a bit more growth. And here's one which, again, I think is so frequently forgotten, but really does matter. Planning rules matter. This is a very important form of regulation. In that sense, it's a very important part of industrial policy. Few people seem to realize how draconian our planning system is and what huge distortions it introduces into the running of the economy. Paul Cheshire is, to his enormous credit, one person who's been saying that for so many years, he's probably forgotten when he started to say it, possibly when he was in short trousers, that would be a long time ago, just to pick one of his results out from that economic journal paper in 2008, a regulatory tax rate, it implies a regulatory tax rate on office space of around 300%. Offices cost you more in Manchester than Manhattan. It's possibly a surprising statistic. More generally, I think this potentially constrains successful British cities and stops them growing. An economic historian sees sort of Preston and Oldham and Blackburn growing like crazy in the 19th century and observes Cambridge apparently completely constrained in the 21st century. Here, I think, is the link to the policy change that might possibly have a short-term effect as well as a long-term effect. Leaving aside now the direct effect on the productive uh, sector, we can also say that we know that house prices in Britain are a lot higher than they would be, particularly in the southeast, with more liberal planning rules. Uh, recent work at the Centre for Spatial Economics at LSE, which I'm highlighting there, suggests that with full liberalisation, and of course there are lots of housewife, halfway houses between here and full liberalisation, you could see the real house price come down by 35%, and that would probably go with an increase in the equilibrium housing stock of something like half the same number. That would be something of the order of 3 million extra houses. You wouldn't ever get there in one bound, but just making some moves in that direction uh, would surely uh, entail significant short-term stimulus while providing a supply-side reform which is in the direction of welfare gains in the medium to long term. And those welfare gains are potentially massive if you just think, compute in your head some sort of little welfare triangle there. It's not a little welfare triangle, it's actually rather a big welfare triangle. And if there is such a big welfare gain, surely it is possible to address the incentive issues which prevent people from wanting to realise some of it now. And people like Tim Besley and Tim Loynig have been pushing that. What have I been saying about the most effective role for UK government? Well, I think I've said in, in two instalments, good horizontal policies do matter, and we can improve on what we've been doing. And generally speaking, a presumption in favour of competition is a, a good idea, not returning to the 1970s. Broadly speaking, again, I think most economists will think there is an important role in identifying and addressing effectively market failures and not forgetting cost-benefit analysis, especially as applied to South Warwickshire. The big message, though, on this chart is this third bullet point. Whenever I hear people discuss the most effective role for government, I think I hear the conversation being hijacked, in a sense, by science and technologists. Now, I've nothing against the general argument that there are much bigger social returns than private returns to R&D, and government should certainly be clear about that and put policies in place to address that market failure. So nothing I have to say denigrates that. I firmly believe it. But I think the thing which goes with it is to recognise that a very important part of technological change and productivity improvement comes from diffusion not from invention and initial innovation. More importantly, we need to remember that a great deal of that technology comes from other countries. It's actually the rest of the world's R&D that delivers a large part of the productivity improvement in the UK.
When we think about diffusion, I think it's really important to say, where do the benefits of new technology accrue? They typically accrue mainly from use, and in the medium term, mainly to the users. They don't accrue to the inventors. It's use of technology, which really should be the focus of a significant part of horizontal uh, industrial policy. And that certainly brings in regulation and competition as things which potentially affect diffusion. Delays in the adoption of new technologies are, in a sense, things, times lost that never can be regained. Uh, the classic example, I think, is Jerry Hausman's study of cell phones in the US, where regulatory delay caused a big consumer welfare loss. Okay, let me just uh, sort of underline that. And I've uh, flagged up one of Jonathan's collaborators here rather than himself because she's young and she deserves a plug. And Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Jonathan was one of the co-authors here. Looking at their growth accounting, uh, growth accounting for labour productivity growth in the UK market sector over about 20 years to 2008, yes, R&D does play a role, but it's not a dominant role. And notice that it is quite a lot smaller than other intangibles or TFP gains coming from other sources. Again, just set next to this, and I've put my own name on this because I, I borrowed it from somewhere and published it. Uh, it's actually from the EU CLEMS website. Uh, that's what it really should probably say. What was the biggest contributor to productivity growth in the market sector over something like the same period? The answer, wholesale and retail trade. Napoleon was right. We are a nation of successful shopkeepers, but not perhaps as successful as we should be, because in a moment we're going to recognise that that contribution could have been quite a lot better. But let me just think about wholesale and retail trade, just to rub this point in. This would be considered irrelevant by traditional industrial policy. It does diddly squat R&D, I suspect. Um, that's a technical term, not very much anyway. But as I said a moment ago, it's the sector that contributed most. Why did it contribute so much? Because it has been able very successfully to use new technology. Things like the barcode just transformed uh, retailing starting from the late 1970s. But even in this sector where we've been more successful than some of our neighbours, again we have plenty of research including Paul Cheshire again and Jonathan himself, which says actually we've paid quite a high cost in this sector for the planning regulations that we've chosen to have. TFP in modern supermarkets, you'll be pleased to know, is considerably lower than the supermarkets constructed in the late 1980s because of the restrictions. Policy implications then. It would be really good to have evidence-based policy reform. The problem is not the lack of evidence. That's the key thing to take away, perhaps, as my message. We need a sense of proportion, we need a sense of the numbers. We need to know, for example, that R&D subsidies, yes, they're valid, they're important, they have a place, but they're not the only thing that matters for productivity. They're almost certainly not the most important thing. Things like planning rules matter as well. And we do want to keep banging on that if you want more industrial policy, you do not be careless about what it does to competition. Okay, time to wake up for the final time. Lessons three is last set of lessons. Okay, last set of lessons. The recovery is pretty weak. I think that's fairly clear, notwithstanding some difficulties of the numbers. It's weak compared with either the 1930s or the 1980s, and perhaps that's to do with the credit boom and bust and the difficulties that imposes in terms of headwinds. If, as I've tended to argue, there may be limited scope directly to act on the side of aggregate demand, then that would put the onus on thinking about supply-side policy as something to complement any kind of demand stimulus. Ideally, you're wanting some sort of supply-side change, which creates 
demand growth in the economy. And suggested that fiscal consolidation could surely be made more productivity friendly. I believe that could be done without necessarily violating some terrible fairness constraint. And I do think we should take the lesson from history that radical supply side reform, which was really the case in the 80s, delivered some growth and similar but not the same recipe might do so again even today and even in the short term. But the obstacles to that are not the lack of evidence, not the lack of good economics, but the political difficulties of implementing any such policy. Thank you. That's all, folks.